of us here know that we are present at the making of history. Generating power using nuclear energy has been around for 70 years. About 450 nuclear power plants currently provide nearly 10% of the world's energy needs. Although there have been 100 incidents involving nuclear power generation, thankfully there have only been three major accidents where the reactor core was damaged and radiation was released. The first was in 1979 at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Operator errors and a loss of coolant led to a partial core meltdown and a minor release of radioactive gases. The most serious incident was Chernobyl in the Soviet Union in 1986. A flawed reactor design and inadequate safety procedures led to a power surge that ended with an explosion and a complete meltdown of reactor number four. And most recently at Fukushima in Japan in 2011. A tsunami damaged the reactor and the loss of electrical power led to overheating, which caused a partial meltdown and the release of radioactive gases. To understand what happens when a nuclear reactor has a meltdown, we should start with how a nuclear power plant works. Typical nuclear power plants operating today are water or advanced gas-cooled reactors. Uranium is stored as small pellets inside of fuel rods. Around 200 of these rods are bundled together to make a fuel assembly. Over 200 fuel assemblies make up the reactor core. Most reactor cores are also filled with water, covering the fuel rods. The water has two purposes. One, it keeps the fuel rods cool. Two, it moderates the nuclear fission occurring inside the reactor, stabilizing the chain reaction. Control rods are named aptly. They're inserted into the core to reduce the reaction rate, keeping it under control. To increase the reaction rate, the rods are removed. All of this is aimed towards generating heat through the nuclear fission reaction in the fuel rods. The heat turns the water into steam, which spins a turbine, generating electricity. Dr. Lewis Blackburn is a lecturer in nuclear materials at the University of Sheffield in the UK. So what's happening in, in this type of reactor is that we have a fissile component that comprises a fuel. So this is something such as uranium-235. And what's happening in the fission process is that nuclei of, of uranium-235 are essentially quite metastable. If they encounter a neutron, and that neutron's incorporated within the nucleus of U-235, very quickly becomes very unstable and it will fission into different fragments. What happens as a result of that is the nucleus, if you can imagine the nucleus is like a sphere, it essentially splits off into, into two sort of unequal components. So you form essentially two new um, isotopes and you also release neutrons and, and heat, essentially decay energy. So then that, that energy is essentially transferred to coolant. So the fuel is contained in what we call cladding. So the fuel pellets are cladded up in a type of alloy. Um, so this could be something like a stainless steel alloy or a, a zirconium rich alloy um, and then there's a coolant medium. So the primary objective of a nuclear reactor is to transfer the heat and the energy that's given off in the fission process to generate electricity. And in order to do that, much like with a coal power plant or a, or a gas turbine station or whatever it may be, all you're trying to do is capture that heat and, and transfer it efficiently to um, an end electricity output. All conventional nuclear reactors require cooling with either water or gas. The heated coolant goes through heat exchangers, which create steam to power the electricity generators. In regular operation, the reactor's output is regulated by the control rods. Dr. Blackburn explains more. So these are made from materials that have what's called a very high neutron absorption cross-section. What this basically means is the materials that we use to make these rods are very, very good at soaking up neutrons and the neutrons are essentially what are driving this reaction constantly. So let's say you're in a, in a scenario where you need to kill your reaction dead for whatever reason. Then they'll, they'll place these big rods in, usually made of boron compounds, so something like boron carbide. That, that stops the reaction. However, all those fission products that you've formed in the fuel, these have caused the fuel to be very hot and it takes a very long time for that heat to dissipate. And that's the main problem. A nuclear reactor meltdown is a catastrophic failure in which the core of a nuclear reactor overheats. This leads to the melting of its fuel and possibly releasing harmful radiation into the environment. 
Nuclear reactors rely on the cooling system to maintain the temperature of the reactor core. The fuel rods inside the core, typically made of uranium or plutonium, generate significant heat due to nuclear fission. If the cooling system fails due to mechanical failure, natural disasters like an earthquake or tsunami, or human error, the core temperature can rise to dangerous levels. Without cooling, the heat generated by nuclear fission cannot be dissipated. This causes the fuel rods to heat up excessively. Let's take the case of Fukushima as, a, as an example. One of the first things that basically happened there was the tsunami and earthquake com combination disrupted power supply to the reactor. And importantly, it, it basically knocked out the backup generators that, that um, are there to, to pump the coolant through the core. Although the, the control rods uh, slammed in basically immediately, the, the reaction, the fission reaction has basically stopped. However, the fuel is still very hot. This is called radiogenic heat. If you can't circulate the coolant, the water, for example, then what you'll find happening is that the water starts to evaporate and it starts to boil off. If this is allowed to keep continuing, then you find yourself in a situation where the fuel eventually becomes uncovered, unexposed, and importantly, there's no medium from which to transfer the heat away from, from the fuel. And that's when you're really in trouble. So that's when you can start to really elevate the temperature of the cladding material. And eventually, um, if, if coolant isn't supplied uh, through some other medium, then uh, we enter sort of what's, what's commonly known as, an, as a meltdown scenario. As the temperature rises, the zirconium cladding surrounding the fuel rods begins to react with steam, producing hydrogen gas. The buildup of hydrogen gas can lead to an explosion. This was a significant issue during the 2011 Fukushima disaster, where hydrogen gas explosions occurred, damaging the reactor buildings. As the temperature continues to increase, the fuel rods themselves can begin to melt, this process is called a core melt. The uranium or plutonium fuel inside the rods can reach temperatures over 2,000 degrees Celsius or 3,632 degrees Fahrenheit. This is high enough to melt the concrete and steel surrounding the core and form a molten mass, including highly hazardous radioactive isotopes. The fuel components themselves will start to melt probably above maybe 2,000 degrees Celsius. And what you're left with, if you don't basically contain this, is a substance become known as corium. Um, and this word comes from reactor core. And that's because essentially it's a melted, almost glass-like product that forms after a reactor melts down. The presence of things like silicon and aluminium and whatever else in, in the concrete and the, in the steel components and, and the fuel cladding kind of all melts together and you get like a horrible, highly radioactive solid, it's like a lava type material. As the core melts and the containment structures fail, radioactive materials can be released into the atmosphere. This includes gases like iodine-131, cesium-137 and strontium-90, all harmful to human health. The radiation can contaminate the surrounding areas, air, water and soil. The released radiation can have long-lasting effects. People exposed to high levels of radiation can suffer from acute radiation sickness, an increased risk of cancer, and other health issues. The affected area may also become uninhabitable for years or even decades, as seen in Chernobyl and Fukushima, where large exclusion zones were established due to high radiation levels. As part of the reaction process and in meltdown, new highly radioactive elements are created that last centuries. Plutonium-239, for example, has a half-life of about 24,000 years. Some of the fission products have even longer half-lives. Things like technetium-99 have got half-lives of hundreds of thousands of years. Clearly, not only in the dis dispersal of spent nuclear fuel, but in, in the eventual decommissioning of these meltdown products, we have to consider that some elements that are contained within this this lava type material will will essentially be around forever on a relative time scale for humans and engineering projects we're trying to design you know materials and, and processes that can isolate this source these sort of elements from the from the wider environment forever the disposal of spent nuclear fuel it, it, it's a very technically difficult thing to do however you know 
spent fuel when it's contained and cooled properly and dispersed off properly is far easier to dispose of than something like a meltdown product. All of the reactors that have been involved in accidents where radiation has escaped have been based on technology that dates back to the early days of nuclear energy. The next generation of nuclear reactors are designed to be inherently safe, meaning meltdowns could become physically impossible. The Gen 4 reactors, as they are called, use advanced technologies to eliminate the risk of meltdowns. Three types are showing promise. Molten salt reactors use liquid fuel that expands when heated, naturally slowing the nuclear reaction. Pebble bed reactors use tennis ball-sized fuel that can't overheat even when the cooling fails. And fast neutron reactors are super efficient and produce less long-lived radioactive waste. CEO and Head of Reactor Development at Nanonuclear Energy Inc., James Walker, explains. The new reactors are using coolants with much higher boiling temperatures, and that means you can reduce things like the pressurizer. Even if things were to break in it, you don't get that boiling effects that disables the reactor removing heat from the fuel, so it, they, they become inherently much safer. And water was never the best coolant to use, but it's what the world got used to and what the designs um, got optimized for and what the regulators all got used, used to too. So for advanced reactors, there are, there are definitely better solutions. There are definitely better tech. And all of these new technologies will be inherently safer. They will, a lot of them, um, have passive cooling in them so that if everything was to break, the reactor still can't melt down and it's just a mechanical fix. So it's, it's going to be a very different nuclear environment to what we're historically used to. Gen 4 reactors are a game changer, offering inherent safety features that could make meltdowns a thing of the past. However, these Gen 4 reactors are still barely out of the R&D stage, with building works only recently being started. The first of these being constructed in America is by Kairos Power in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This will be a fluoride salt-cooled high-temperature reactor. Targeted to be operational by 2027, it will be primarily built just to demonstrate the ability to produce affordable nuclear heat, with an electricity-producing next iteration proposed for building at a later date. China, however, are further along the road with their Gen 4 reactors, being the first country to operate a demonstration Generation 4 reactor. The HTRPM in Shandong is a pebble-bed-type, high-temperature gas-cooled reactor. It was connected to the grid in December 2023, making it the world's first Gen 4 reactor to enter commercial operation. While it may take a decade or two to see large-scale power plants come online, there is the potential of seeing Gen 4 tech implemented into small modular reactors, or SMRs, in the short term. With many companies investing in this tech, like Rolls-Royce and James Walker's company Nano Nuclear Energy Inc., there is a strong possibility that we will soon see private nuclear facilities being built to scale for localised businesses with heavy energy use needs. As we continue decarbonising, nuclear energy will almost certainly have to play a key role in powering a sustainable future. And just in time, as there is more demand for electricity than ever. Energy use is set to increase by a staggering amount in the future due to a few major innovations. EVs are growing more and more common. They provide a sustainable and more environmentally friendly mode of transportation. Many countries like the UK have sworn to ban sales of gas and diesel vehicles by 2030, pushing demand even further. But EVs need to be charged. And as of now, there isn't enough power to charge all of them. Another innovation that is currently looking to create a massive burden on electricity is AI. AI is also another incredibly energy-hungry, well, machinery, essentially. And the projections with regard how much energy it needs um, exceed what the grid is capable of producing for it. AI models use dizzying amounts of energy to process every prompt that goes through them. In fact, in a single day, ChatGPT alone uses enough energy to power the Empire State Building for a year and a half. This does not yet include all the data centers that America plans to build. Nuclear power could be the answer to our energy needs. Many tech companies are already looking at solutions like SMRs as a self-contained power source for their data centers. Microsoft is even looking at directly renting power from Three Mile Island when it fully reopens. However, the tech has its downsides as well. 
The biggest one might be getting the reactor built in the first place. Nuclear reactors are multi-billion dollar projects. They need huge amounts of capital to get started, not including the licensing fees and the cost of adhering to regulation standards. Time is money. And for nuclear reactors, they need even more time just to get built. And the costs don't stop after, with even more money needed to maintain it. It's an intimidating investment, and it can be difficult to convince investors that it's worth it. SMRs may mitigate some of the cost issues, but there are still regulation issues for privatised nuclear facilities to overcome. However, the main holdup in this case appears to be access to fuel. I think the reactors could be ready very soon. I think some of these big SMRs that could service data centers and tech and AI could be online in theoretically 2026, 2027. I think the issue for a lot of these, these systems is that the infrastructure to produce the, the fuel that these reactor systems needs needs to be built back. And, I, and that's the bottleneck. So whereas the reactor, if fuel was abundant, you could see these things going out in 2026, 2027. I think until that bottleneck is addressed and groups like us and Rano and Urenco have built back a lot of the enrichment capabilities in, in countries like the United States, you won't see the mass production of these systems until 2030 or 2031. Even Arano in the US, they just moved um, to Tennessee to build a centrifuge facility to manufacture the, 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 the material the industry needs, but it could still take them five, six, seven years to build that centrifuge plant and get out the capacity the industry needs. So I'm going to be relatively conservative and say that we probably will see reactors being deployed that, um, that uh, data centers will utilize, but they won't, be, they won't have massive uptake until the early 2030s, I think is, is reasonable. Another challenge is nuclear waste disposal. The truth is, Nuclear reactors don't actually produce that much waste relative to the number of people each one serves. About only 5 grams of high-level waste is produced per person served after recycling. But that radioactive waste still needs to be put somewhere. Proper transportation and storage sites are necessary. The waste will stay in these storage sites until it finishes decaying. Lastly, there's public perception. Most people still think of nuclear reactors as unstable and unreliable, despite substantial efforts to make them safer. It has yet to escape the terrible reputation it gained from massive nuclear meltdowns like Chernobyl or the destructive power of nuclear bombs. Before anyone can build a nuclear plant, they must first convince the surrounding residents of its safety. There are a lot of benefits to nuclear power, but there are also a lot of challenges to its use. With all this in mind, would nuclear power be capable of answering to humanity's ever-increasing electrical needs? Remember to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to stay updated with our latest content. And while you're here, why not check out another one of our exciting videos? Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.